Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining another episode of Prop Talk, a property management podcast powered by Resmond. I'm Elizabeth Francisco. I am president of Resmond, and I'm your host for today's trailblazing episode with Don Way. Let me tell you a little bit about Don before we get started. Don has spent the last eight years building one of the most successful apartment management companies in our industry. The founder of CityGate Property Group. She is a successful entrepreneur. She is a senior leader. She's an industry champion, which I have seen for myself. And she's involved in various charities and in her community, including Restore Hope Ministries, Refuge City, and Furnishing Families of Texas, and has a current appointed seat on the board of Denton County Child Protective Services, as if you don't have enough to do. (laughs) And she also happens to be one of my most favorite people, and I have honored uh, to have her as a friend. I genuinely look up to her, and uh, I'm just very appreciative you took the time to join me today. Well, I am beyond humbled uh, that you would ask me to do this. You are one of my favorite people, and I look up to you, so I think the feeling's mutual. So I'm very happy to be here. Oh, well, you know what that really means? That just means we prop each other up on a regular basis. <laughs> That's what that means. You know, it, it's funny because I, I do think about how we we came to know each other and how I've seen you in the industry. And I do mean what I say about looking up to you because watching you champion for the industry is such an important thing about what we do. I don't think I know the story of how you actually got in the industry. And so I'm just curious, like, what brought you to multifamily to begin with? Because you're such a good champion for us. Well, that's a real funny story. Actually, I started off in nursing and in order to pay for my, you know, fund my vision to go to nursing school, I started working part time for a temp agency. My first gig was at Nabisco Cookie Factory. And after about 10 pounds later, um, when you could go into the factory and get a bag every uh, Thursday, I decided that I asked for a transfer. And I ended up at a company called Furlan Corporation as okay. their receptionist. And I worked up from there. Oh, and was that a management company? Yes, Furlan oh. Management Company. They oh, had wow. HUD and they also had conventional. Oh, my goodness. So you started in the back office. I did, <laughs> answering the phone. Oh, wow. So, yeah, we both started as temps. And for the temp agencies out there that service our industry, that was a heck of a plug. (laughs) Just saying. There's no telling how far you can go with the right initiative. (laughs) So, you know, if you started in the back office and really started in the receptionist role, how did you, like, make that transition from starting there in the industry to being the successful you know, leader that you have been from an operational standpoint in our industry? I've just been in the right place at the right time, but I had a lot of initiative. You know, I was given tasks as receptionist that really brought out my administrative gene. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, I moved up to the vice president's uh, assistant to do paperwork. But at that time, we don't even want to go back that far because I can trust you. <laughs> trust me, nobody would even know what, you know, the blinking orange, you know, on the uh, probably carbon copies had something to do with it, too, at that time. But that's how I started. And I just got bit by the business. And mm-hmm. I realized that nursing was great, but I ended up meeting my husband, uh, who was in the military. And so then it ensued, like with, you know, different duty stations. Oh. And the best place to Uh, reinvent yourself is in real estate Mm -hmm. every single two years. So that's how I ultimately ended up where I am. But there were, it was multifaceted. Really? So what do you think it is? It's funny that you just said about our industry. And I don't know that it's fair to say it attracts. We need to do a better job of that because this is an amazing industry. But once you get in, you get bit by the industry. And, you know, we can, you know, I think about my career and I think about people who have come and gone in our lives. And I can also think about people who have tried to escape. And I think we always jokingly say it's like the mafia. They're going to bring you back in. But it's always funny we say it that way because we truly are joking. People come back because they love it. And I have friends outside of multifamily that are envious when they hear me come back talking about our conferences or how we engage with one another or even how the competitive landscape can actually be really supportive in our space. So I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think is 
it is about multifamily that makes this space so special. For me, a lot of it was tied up with who I was as a person. It, it's the one place you can go and you can live a novel. I mean, there's like, you know, whether it's mystery or murder or, you know, there's all <laughs> kinds of things. Not murder. There's all kinds of um, elements to this that make it so attractive. But if you're somebody who loves numbers, you can get that. If you're somebody that loves people, you can get that. If mm -hmm. you're somebody that just loves being part of the action, you can get that because there's plenty of action in property management. Yeah. There's so much action. There's a reason we don't have our own real world show. <laughs> we should, though. <laughs> we can't Maybe that's next. That. <laughs> Maybe that's a spinoff. Moving around the country. Did you work for a lot of different management companies? Were you able to kind of grow your career within one uh, family, per se? Or what was the journey like from, from a management perspective? So while I was in Rhode Island, um, I was working for Furlan Corporation, but I also had my real estate license. Okay. My dad was a realtor. And I would get the listings and he would sell them. Mm -hmm. So when my first duty station, I was down in Florida, uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, mm -hmm. and I worked for another woman, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, Buck and Buck Realtors, and <laughs> she was the president of the Florida Association of Realtors. And I started in the front office there and then started to do bookkeeping for her. And so every step of the way, every place we went, there was something new that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked for an appraiser at one point. I worked wow. for somebody who was doing commercial real estate at one point. So it was like I had the opportunity to glean from great people who had mentors mm -hmm. who had amazing, you know, careers themselves. Yeah. So it's funny in our industry, it's very much sink or swim and being a jack of all trades and, and learning and gaining from all of these different facets along the way. I think I might be seeing how you've become as successful as you are now that I'm learning more about the story. And I think that's kind of where, you know, I'd like to start is how did you go from making the, you know, coming up through property management and in the real estate office to starting your own property management company, especially because what, what year did you start um, CityGate Group? 2014. So 2014, I can think about when we were in the market and our just customer base at the time at Resman, and there wasn't, from what I recall, a lot of female-owned property management companies, um, at least not that I had a lot of access to, and I don't recall seeing them a lot. So how did you do that? And talk to us about what that was like. So I'd have to go back to, like, when I was in Florida, I had a, um, I had run a company, a a division for small assets. Okay. So it was single family and, but mm -hmm. I was in a military town. So it was very easy mm -hmm. to, people were always moving in and moving out. Then people would say, Oh, they'd purchase a house and they'd say, we need somebody to rent it, but we're coming back because this is going to be our final duty station. And then they'd get somewhere overseas and want mm -hmm. to do something else and say, Hey, will you sell my house for me? Then the person that was living in there was like, gosh, I really love this place. I'm even though I changed duty stations, I'm going to come back here. So they would buy the house. So it became very easy to do that. But I also had a taste of, you know, the 12 units, the duplexes, so the small assets. So fast forward. And when I was working for Pinnacle Corporation, I was with them for five years. I was a regional, I was a regional supervisor, not a maintenance supervisor. Uh, I was yeah, but if I know you, you leaned in <laughs> and have some maintenance skill sets. <laughs> well, I am married to a plumber. Just saying. While I was working for them, my goal was to not retire, but to go into ministry full time. And on the part time, like maybe have a Remax office with because I'm a broker, um, have a real estate you know office that would, you know, help fund that vision for ministry and do small assets. And then... <laughs> One day I got a call from a good friend in the industry and she said, I'd like you to come and interview for night with night vest as a VP. Oh, that's right. And I said, oh, I'm really not interested. I'm just going to, you know, do what I'm going to do. And it wasn't an open plan because I was waiting to get my big bonus, you know, after that year to, uh, you know, start that other company. And once I met David Moore and Casey Crombach, they were the most amazing uh, people. And so they gave me an opportunity to work for them, VP of their third party operations. And about six months into it, they decided that they didn't want to do third party. Hmm. So I was left with an uh, with a choice to either leave and go somewhere else, mm -hmm. work for whoever they sold the company to or purchase the company from them. And at the time, I didn't have the capital, but they capitalized me. And that's how CityGate started. Oh, wow. 
Wow, that's a phenomenal story. And yeah. kudos to you. That says a lot that you were able to for them to invest in you like that. So your time with them obviously was well spent. I'm, I'm sure both parties benefited, <laughs> you know, because if you hadn't been doing your job, I'm guessing the capital wouldn't have been there to fund your business. <laughs> well, wh- <laughs> it's funny how that works. Yeah. And what's kind of funny about it, too, is when Casey said that to me, I was like, this was not on my five or 10 year plan. So, you know, that's not what I was looking to do. So I went and I asked four of my friends, two said Ron, two (laughs) said, oh, my God, that's a great opportunity. And then I went home to uh, the one person that would put me back into reality, which is my husband, who has zero Mm -hmm. risk. And he said, Dawn, that's such a great opportunity. And I was like, where is my husband and what have you done with him? <laughs> so, um, you know, I jumped and it was a raging river. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, how long had the uh, third party management um, business been in place up to that point for Nightvest? Yeah, Nightvest wasn't interested in doing third party management. They were interested in owning their own assets. So what would happen is they would sell an asset and then and somebody would and somebody would say, can you just stay on? Okay. And that's how they ended up building. And there were 12... 12 properties, 1,200 units. Oh my gosh. When we so, started CityGate. What was it like for you to, to actually like sign the documents? Because <laughs> I'm just thinking in my own hand, like uh, Resmond didn't really come about quite that same way, but there were times when we got investments and the, there wasn't a lot of documents signed in the beginning, but there's a certain point in time where you basically realize what you're signing your life away to. And uh, I'm just wondering, what was that like for you? So I'd like to tell you it was like really pretty and I was so professional and I I think I was in the fetal position like on the weekends, just like, what am I doing? How am I going to pull this off? But, you know, I have a God, right? And who he calls, he equips. Mm -hmm. And so I can honestly tell you that I just didn't look back. I had a great foundation with what Night Vest had started, but I had to learn everything. I had to learn how to do insurance. I had to learn how to do payroll. I had to learn how to do the accounting. So I literally did every single job. And I had people that were mm-hmm. working with me on the team and they would they would take care of the day to day, but I was doing all of the back office. And that mm-hmm. was such an opportunity to learn that mm-hmm. I wouldn't have had if I would have just yeah. you know hired somebody to do that. And so that's how I that's how we grew. So how did you come up with the name? Uh, I just popped into my head. I was like, I don't think I I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, we went through a couple of names, my husband and I did. Okay. Uh, and he didn't own any part of City Gate, but we would, every morning we would pray before this because we wanted to be in ministry, right? Mm-hmm. So we would always pray for uncommon favor at the City Gates. And I had gone oh. through a program called Gates of Influence. And it was like they, it was a beacon that was there like the whole time. So mm-hmm. when I finally settled on City Gate, I was like, man, that was such common sense. I should have thought about that, you know, than the other 10 names that we were mulling around. So <laughs> that's where it came from, City Gate, because in the olden days, business was transacted at the City Gates. Oh, wow. Oh, that is a cool story. I love that. <laughs> I didn't know. That was so impromptu. I'm so glad I asked that question because it was mulling around in my head. Ah, oh, that's a really good story. So it, from our warm and fuzzy moment, thinking back to the realities of running a business, what did the business plan look like? Because I, as I've gotten to know you over the years and I've watched you grow the business, obviously because of our relationship, you know, I, I know that your properties perform really, really well. Um, I know some of your investors. I've met them actually recently at some IMN conferences and uh, they have great things to say. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious about thinking about it from a, an executive level, a strategic level progression. You know, what what were you thinking in terms of like a business plan when you started the business and kind of how did that maybe change or evolve over time or did it? So traditionally, if you're going to start a business, you write a business plan. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a business plan, but the people that were capitalizing it weren't looking for a business plan. They had seen it in action. Yeah. So we just kept doing what we were doing. And part of that is being transparent with our clients, being honest, being upfront mm-hmm. and being present. And always, always, you know, telling the truth and, you know, no matter how much it hurt, just being honest. So I can say that part of the business plan was building that relationship because Mm -hmm. in property management, you're only as good as your last 30 day numbers if you're third party. (laughs) But if you have relationship and people know you and they know that you have integrity and they know that you have service in your heart and that you're working, you know, Mm -hmm. to the best, not in perfection, but in excellence, they're going to stay with you because they know that you're going to work whatever it is out that needs to be worked out. Yeah. 
So it's funny you said that about service. I don't know if I ever told you the story, but during um, April or May, maybe, of 20, after the pandemic came in, and I, I think as uh, you guys were just going back into your offices, because I brought you something. There's no greater joy for me than to hear that people um, had great experience and mm -hmm. that they really appreciated, like, what kind of service that we gave, because that's what we're here for. Yeah. Well, and nothing puts that put that more to the test than, obviously, what we dealt with as an industry, and I can only imagine for your assets. And I know that you guys were, um, as a leadership team, one of the, the first ones I recall being back in the office and getting in there and leaning in with your, your team. So, you know, kudos to you guys for that. Thank you. Well, I did use it to my advantage. You know, we were necessary. I had to wait for the government to tell me we were necessary, but yeah. we loved it. Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was important to model it. Yep. Well, let's just hope from this point forward with all the conversations happening legislatively and this being a midterm year and some so many things in the multifamily industry becoming front and center that they remember that there's a reason we are essential mm -hmm. and we're the experts. We are good at what we do. I always I felt like during the pandemic that really came to light. I know for the, for people in my friend circle that maybe didn't understand multifamily, um, so having that different level of appreciation and understanding what our front lines do and that they were in people's apartments, they were still there to service them. Um, so let, let's hope that has a long lasting impact in on the general public and specifically our legislators. And the people that work in the communities are the heroes. Mm -hmm. They're the boots on the ground. And yep. they're the ones that uh, we depend on. Yep. I would agree. They made you know, my life look easy. Yes. Well, you know, it's funny. I always, I always think in that there has always been a part of me. I don't know if you felt this way, but coming up through the ranks and, and leasing and, and, you know, I skipped the assistance position, went to being a lease up manager. But there's, there's something special about being out on site. And when you move up into corporate, there is a little bit of that that I always missed. And I never knew how to exactly characterize it because it is close, sometimes a little too close. Um, because it's, you become like family, you know, and so I, I think that's the great part of multifamily. But and it's not that we don't have family at our corporate. It's just there's a different level of, um, I don't know, stress, pressures. It's, it's just a different environment. And you don't always get that same level of closeness that and playfulness that we had out on site. Well, <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of what our secret sauce was at CityGate is we didn't forget who mm -hmm. the people were that were really making it happen. And your regionals, who are the 360-degree leaders, that literally have to mm -hmm. reach up, reach down, reach across, and be able to um, function under, like, such high pressure and deadlines. Mm -hmm. And so when we started CityGate, we began with the end in mind. And we wanted to be service to our teams as well and not just to our clients. Mm -hmm. So we made sure that we weren't continuously rolling things out on people and rolling things out and making it burdensome for them mm -hmm. to have to like take on something new and, you know, just find another way to make it to the property or, you know, mm -hmm. stay, you know, an hour later to work just on reports. Yeah. Well, kudos for you. Uh, I always joke internally that the customers I always get the most excited about working with and having on our software are the customers I could have seen myself working with and being part of their team. And so you guys were always one of those people for me. Well, I've been team Resmond from uh, the word go. Yes. And we, and I very much appreciate it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there is some CityGate DNA in our software. <laughs>
Yeah, and well, that's a specific shout out to Jenny and Jennifer and, and Golden and <laughs> yes, yeah, the whole crew. Yes, your husband gives you the the go ahead and and says let's do this, and we start the business. I'm curious about what were your perceptions about what a, being a business owner was going to be like, and how did that align with reality? So I had the benefit of having Morning Glory Services prior to. It was a construction clean company, and my husband had done plumbing through that. Oh, okay. So I had some expectation of what it took, and that's where mm -hmm. the service came from. What I did not anticipate was the unusual amount of stress that goes with signing that paperwork. Because all of a sudden, you become responsible. At the time, it was for 45 people. When we mm -hmm. sold the company to Asset Living... It was 450 employees, or oh. maybe a little less than that, but we mm -hmm. had gotten up to about 450 employees. When you think about that, there's so many things that can happen with the people, and they're your family, mm -hmm. and you want to be there for them. And then there's lawsuits, and then there's other things that a lot of people don't really understand. They think being mm -hmm. an owner is just a cakewalk and that you have the money rolling in and it's the rolling the dough. Well, the reality is, is in the very <laughs> beginning, you're the last one that gets paid if that ends up happening. And that didn't happen for us, thank God, uh, because we were well capitalized. But you have to really factor those mm -hmm. pressure moments in. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned that. So they, you know, the the saying that leaders eat last. I don't know if it, the audience can see, but um, my laptop is like eight years old. <laughs> so leaders also get equipment last. <laughs> That's the joke of the company. Somebody will pick up my laptop. I'm like, how old is that thing? And why does it weigh so much? <laughs> So uh, you're exactly right about that. And, uh, you know, I think about in our space, and I don't know if you had moments like this, but trying to start a, a tech company without funding, because we, we weren't funded. Um, and we didn't get our first investment until 2016. And there's a lot of nail biting that goes into those early days. And I think the thing that was the most stressful for me was the weight of all the employees that took that leap of faith to come with us. like. It was never, I never got myself in the, in the headspace about, am I going to be okay? Like, I couldn't even, I never could get even to that point. My biggest concern was people are depending on us. Like, we have to succeed. And then we have customers depending on us as well. But that weight of these are people's lives. This is their livelihood. This is how they pay their mortgage, their rent. This is how they pay for their kids, you know, diapers. And, and that, to me, was um, a lot of weight that... For people who are looking to start a business and as you as you start down that path, you're right. I don't think you can fully appreciate that, what that's going to be like. And, you know, I think the good people that have the right service heart and put people first are the ones that succeed and are the ones that view that as the great responsibility that it is. So I think there's times in life that you have vision mm -hmm. and then you have divine appointments. CityGate was a divine appointment. It pushed me past what I could even have thought was inside of me, right? Uh, I've never started a business and said, what mm -hmm. am I going to do if it fails? I've always been like, what am I going to do when it succeeds? And am I going to be prepared for it? And that's why it's really important if you're thinking of starting a business, count the cost. Count wh whatever you're doing. If you're selling widgets, make sure you know how much a widget costs. Make sure you know how much it's going, your payroll is going to be. There's certain things that you need to do. Write the budget before you you end mm -hmm. up. CityGate was totally different, it, in, and that's how God's economy works. Usually it's upside down, right? You start <laughs> with, with just the hope and the faith that, okay, there but for the grace of God go I and, you know, just jump in. Mm -hmm. And that's how CityGate started. Uh, we had a great foundation, but it was an appointment. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it like it was my, it was not my, it was never my vision. And I can remember the day I got on the tollway and I was praying and I was like, God, I don't have any kind of vision for this. What am I going to do? We were about to mm -hmm. like flip the switch. And I remember clearly, like not audibly, but clearly in my spirit hearing, I'm glad you don't, because if you did, you'd screw it up. So just like <laughs> be quiet, sit back and just keep on working, you know, work it out day by day. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you, you say that about, I, I think about all the uh, <laughs> different leaders that I, I've had the good fortune to get to know, um, not only in my own career in multifamily, but, you know, being on Resmond's side and with our, our customers. And I think if, if you're, if we're talking to the younger audience and people who are looking to start their businesses or, you know, coming up through the ranks of multifamily, 
I think sometimes there's this impression that the, the leaders know everything. <laughs> Um, and it's a weird thing to say this because we don't, but yes, you do need to still have faith in us because we do have the experience. Um, it does take a special amount of drive, faith, and confidence to push yourself forward. But I think it's the awareness when you know you don't know everything that can help you be a better leader. Absolutely. And it also helps you surround yourself with diversity mm-hmm. and somebody who I don't need to know everything. I just need to know the people who know the things that I don't know. Yep. And yeah. then... If I build my team that way, then we have a very well-rounded machine. But if I, you know, get a whole bunch of dawns on the team, it would have most definitely, like, probably sunk in the first year. (laughs) Because every business has the potential to do that within the first year. But I really am so thankful that I had great people that, you know, were surrounding, Mm -hmm. you know, that city. Yes, yes. It's why that self-awareness is a key thing. It's also great to have if you know you can't dress yourself. Um, (laughs) And people who watch our podcast know I talk about that. I always joke, God giveth in some areas and he taketh away in others. And for me, I'm wicked with some software and some spreadsheets. Don't leave me alone in a retail store. (laughs) Self-awareness. So thinking back about, um, because you started up, you know, 2014 and, and the business you, how long were you with Night Fest before that happened? Six months. Oh my! Oh my gosh! That's just quick. <laughs> okay, so that that puts that into perspective. So we're thinking 2013, 14, and then, you know, at that point in time, the industry had come out of the Great Recession, and the market was pretty healthy. But we did have some stabilization that happened over the years. What do you think, uh, being a, a president of a property management company, what is it that separates one from the other as far as performance and um, effectiveness? I think it gets back to knowing, being self-aware and knowing what you need. And that's where, you know, enter stage left came Pat Smith's, Mm -hmm. my business partner, who was my business partner for the whole time that we've owned CityGate. And business partnerships are either good, bad, Mm -hmm. getting divorced, or they're in counseling. And I am so, (laughs) I'm so happy to say (laughs) that the reality is, is that we've had, we had a great relationship um, through that time, but mm-hmm. I didn't need his money. I needed his brains. <laughs> so he, came, I hope Pat hears this. <laughs> he will. I've told him this many times that he, he was someone that had come from the investor side mm-hmm. and he owned properties and he had, he knew the lingo. He knew the talk. He had something that I wanted and mm-hmm. that I wanted to learn and that I wanted to grow into. And I had something that he needed in order to have a property management company, which is the operations part of it. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a yin and yang, and it worked out amazingly. So I would say it gets down to surrounding yourself with the right people. You know, it's it's funny. Um, That's a shout out to Pat because I have seen his budget template. Um, And uh, thank you, by the way, for helping us with our wonderful Budgets Pro Tool. But, um, yes, I could definitely see how his brain works. (laughs) I think think we had to have multiple conversations to explain some of those formulas. (laughs) So, you know, if we're, um, and I, I realize, I don't necessarily believe you were in multifamily per se during the Great Recession, but when we're talking about what makes for an effective leader, one of the things, or effective property management company, um, it's something that comes to mind because, you know, I think about my own story and, and maybe you too now, to go from where we started and now to have our own businesses or to be able to invest back into multifamily um, and it's funny because of the years I've been around to, you know, t- 25, well, it's, okay, it's way over 25 now. I just keep holding on to that one so I don't age. But um, I get asked a lot about, you know, well, how do you, how would you look at this investment or that investment? And you know, what's one of the first things I bring up is who's leading the team, right? And what were they doing during the Great Recession? What were they involved in running a business? Because I've seen so many people come into the space and and I've seen them even with our own customers um, that came in at a very healthy time in the market. And, you know, when you're leading, the true test of your management skills and ability really comes not from the good times, but the hard times. So thinking about it from that perspective, you know, and obviously the start of the pandemic is a very difficult time for many of us. So what what are you would you say are some of the lessons that you've learned during some of the hard times from a business perspective? Well, we, you're right. We've been in this season of everything's great, great, great. And so we have a lot of investors that have never been in a downturn market. Mm-hmm. They got a taste of it with COVID. 
mm-hmm. to understand like how something can go so you know south in a in a minute, mm-hmm. right? And though I, what I have to say is I'm very proud of how we dealt with it as an industry. Mm-hmm. Um, it just shows the fortitude that we have, um, and that's across the industry, and that's our apartment associations that really stepped up to the plate to like bridge the gap and gave us the information that we needed so that mm-hmm. we could stay abreast and keep our clients abreast. But everybody was really nervous when mm-hmm. that first happened. And nervous is a nice word. I mean, I could even get down to like freaking out possibly yeah. of like, what's going to happen? What's the potential to happen? Oh my gosh, I could lose my property. And oh we, my gosh, how many, how many phone calls would you say you took like that? Probably about 20. Right immediately. Yeah. yeah. Over the, yeah. And, and not in... freaking out though, not all of them, but some were very nervous because they knew that their margin, because let's face mm-hmm. it, I mean, the apartment association gives these statistics, 91 cents on every dollar goes to expenses. Mm-hmm. Nine cents is the margin uh, for profit, but take, if you have extraordinary things, if you have an older building that might have, you know, a chiller system, that margin for profit can go away. If you have a chiller that goes down and other things that may not be forecasted in the performa. Mm-hmm. And that's why, in, and I might not be answering your question, but I think it's it's good to say this, that when we would look at a performer and we would do a performer for a client, mm-hmm. we wanted to make sure that they were thinking of all the risks. So if they were looking at an older community, we would say, make sure you know what's under the building, what's in those pipes, because mm-hmm. those are the things that are going to bite you. Yeah. Um, make sure that you have a healthy chiller. Make sure that you factor for that going down the road. But it's mm-hmm. really important. And we wouldn't just go out there on a limb. If somebody said, oh, I think I can get, you know, 50% increase. It was like, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah, We were realistic. So, you know, we're, we are in this unusual time, like you said, and, and we do have a lot of investors that have, are and continue to flood into the market. And I think in reality, we still haven't been through a real recession Correct. like the economic downturns I've been through. And Correct. that part makes me nervous because we've never had the the support from government funding to prop up the residents in their, their most time of need. So thinking about those phone calls and, the you know, even with your teams, I would imagine, because immediately you probably had to have budget adjustments or spending adjustments because of um, all the PPE stuff that you guys had to get. And mm-hmm. that obviously wasn't budgeted, right? right. Would you say, was that a substantial amount in your budgets? I mean, I heard some people talking like forty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 just out of the blue for new signage and, and you know, but I, different parts of the country went to more extremes than others, I think, about what they were buying. But, you know, how do you have that conversation with a investor who's seeing that, that we just reported as the NMHC Rent Tracker Project, which I was, we were part of at Resmond, that only, you know, 82% of the rent's collected. So did you have conversations like that back then? We did. Um, They had to adjust. And most of them had a realistic expectation of what was going, Mm -hmm. you know, what was on the horizon and what they needed to do. So there were modifications that were made. Um, Thankfully, PPE was a saving grace. I if we had Mm -hmm. not had the PPE, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what could have possibly happened for some of the properties that were you know, being managed that maybe didn't have the profit margin in there to like sustain that type of thing because what the government didn't understand we were the industry that we were being asked to give it all up leave it on the field Mm -hmm. i mean help your resident don't evict Uh, you know our the moratorium (laughs) i mean we had we had residents that year and a half later were still living um in the apartments and there was no rent that had come in but the sustaining Mm -hmm. Uh, the sustainment that happened was based on the PPE and the money that did come in for various residents. So that was good. But when you ask me about a downturn market, the thing you have to do is factor, you should always be closing the back door, Mm -hmm. but it becomes so much more important in a downturn market to make sure that you're not generating turnover that's going to generate costs, especially if you have Mm -hmm. escalating, um, you know, interest rates and inflation and things like that you want to try to minimize that so keep your residents happy and keep them in as much as possible well that right there was a great segue uh whether you meant to do it or not because i think that's one of the questions i would have you know as an operator which i can't help but still want to think like one but being in the markets today in the last several months the back half of 2021 where we're seeing unprecedented churn in the industry supply costs are you know and uh, through the roof, the supply chain issues, but the cost of materials, um, something that I hadn't really heard until I was at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago was about the um, the shipping cost. So 
So when we think about the increase of, of, of labor and materials, that's happening. But then there's this also insane amount of shipping cost increase. I think one one panelist that I heard said something about she compared an invoice that she had bought the same quantity of something um, in 2019. And she, of course, was p- comparing, you know, the quantity, the price per quantity item. And it had gone up. But what blew us all the way in the audience, like an audible gasp, was the shipping cost had gone from $5,000 because they bought in bulk to $20,000. And that just blew me away because I think as an industry, what's happening in our, our space right now, and uh, I think there was a Senate hearing back in maybe end of January, maybe February, um, talking about the affordable housing um, crisis in America and, you know, what role and, and do institutional investors, are they, how are they contributing to this problem? Because it's all focused on rent growth. And it's, occur- you know, recently it's just occurring to me, it's like, where's the conversation about expenses? There's a lack of understanding about there is revenue that comes in from renting apartments, but there's also expense that goes into managing and maintaining those apartments. So I was curious about, like, in your organization, um, you know, the back half of the year and even this first part, what were you guys seeing as far as operational expense and, and how was that adjusting your, your thinking for the rest of this year? So just when you think that you can't take one more squeeze, mm-hmm. the the next squeeze comes, right? Hmm. And if you even if you just look at look at your Amazon shipment that's mm-hmm. coming, I used to just go ahead and like yeah, ship, ship, ship. You know, have mm-hmm. twenty boxes at my door and pay free shipping. Not mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. We're being charged shipping for mm-hmm. things that I in the past. So think of that on a personal level and bring that to an industry. That mm. depends on goods being sold and then the depletion of those goods getting here. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you have, you know, the rising gas and gas petroleum controls a lot of our supplies from carpeting to like fertilizer. I've heard. I mean, there's so chlorine, much chlorine so many things yeah. that we take for granted that we get that Our are now party. exponential. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm. it's so you, you just have to keep on. Mm-hmm modifying and finding the way and then you have employee shortage and good people like through covid decided hey i can live on one paycheck or they found Mm -hmm. another industry to be in and they got out of property management and so trying to find the great managers the great maintenance people right they're not there so it's that's one of the things i did worry about as we you know we we held several uh webinars and you know, we're engaged with you know, all of our customers. And um, at the time, you know, my own daughter was in the industry. And I just, I remember some um, more volatile situations that happened out at one of their properties in Dallas, especially in the, the summer of 20. And um, I could just see the toll it was taking. And, you know, I would go and interact with her and her, her friends, which also happened to be in property management, you know, um, and the front lines. And I could just see it. And I wondered about it. It's true. We're essential, but people seem tired. They really seem like that's a lot because and for our general audience, I mean, most people I hope watching this are uh, in property management, but sometimes we get people that are, you know, maybe investors or lenders. Um, But there is such an emotional toll that takes place in these assets. It's unlike any other product and service that you provide because these are people's homes. And when people are at home, they let their guard down. They interact differently. Then you know they win when they're out in public, but I think during the pandemic, everybody was like that, and everybody was home. And so, you know, and we're coming up. I think in in May is Mental Health Month, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mental Health Awareness. Um, did you guys have any struggles with this with your own teams? Yes, um, yes, they're the best of the best. But you know, even warriors need a place to rest. Mm-hmm. And when you're like that in there, like every day, every day, every day, and then you're facing, you know, everybody who's Mm -hmm. living in apartments are going through the same thing. They're they're human as well. Right. The Mm -hmm. people that that work on site, they have to go home and they have a family and they have pressures. But what I've noticed in our industry, like just over the last year and a half is a Mm -hmm. lot more violence happening or. Hmm. domestic, you know, disputes, things like that, or people coming into the office and, you know, it, it, it escalated from yelling to like being physical. There were a lot of things that we were being challenged with that 
normally we don't talk about that right at the Mm -hmm. apartment association when we're out like you know doing our thing but the reality is is that has been happening and it has escalated and so Hmm. almost to the point where you have people that they literally sometimes can be putting themselves on the line um in that situation Hmm. it doesn't matter where you have your property it can happen anywhere crime doesn't have an address right it can happen anywhere Mm -hmm. but we did see an escalation in that oh my god i I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, I mean, I heard a lot about, about it in, the, in 20, but I didn't, it tended to be tied to some, you know, pent up frustrations about the situation, the social unrest. Mm-hmm. And the stress that comes with that. And then knowing that, you know, you have team members that are on site mm-hmm. that, you know, have the potential to be in harm's way that can keep you up at night. Oh my, well, as it should. Mm-hmm. So what do you, what advice would you give as an industry? Like, what should we be thinking about when it comes to helping our frontline teams because we used to you know joke about being the counselor the psychologist I mean if you're a property manager you're a mediator um you know sometimes a babysitter because kids come hang out in the office after school but given you know what you see I mean 400 employees you've seen a lot um what do you think what do you think as an industry we should be thinking about in that regard it goes past just appreciating people Mm -hmm. It just makes sure that you're in a place where you're doing everything you can to make sure that they have the highest and the best Mm -hmm. um, ability to, um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the words protect themselves. But in a not and I don't mean about guns on site or anything like that. That's (laughs) not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about like, you know, ways that they can communicate, um, you know, it, it just heightened our awareness on Mm -hmm. how to make sure that people were safer. You can't guarantee anybody's safety, but you can make sure that they're aware of, you know, safety. And so some of the things that we would do is uh, do some classes that were focused around, um, Mm. you know, like self-defense. As a matter of fact, the youth gym over in Dallas in the Lake Highlands area has a phenomenal program. Uh, Raphael and one of the Dallas police officers um, on the part time, they they'll teach those classes so you can actually like disarm someone without hurting them. Oh, wow. And those types of things you have to think about. But it doesn't it's not just our industry. There's you know, yeah. I mean, there's other things that happen. You know, you can be working in a furniture store. I think that happened in, in California. California. Yeah. Right. I mean, you so making people aware to be aware Thank and you. keep their eyes open for potential yeah. issues. Yeah. And, you know, you're giving me some some ideas. Not that we, we can solve all the industry's issues because we can't. But it starts somewhere. It starts with conversation. So so thinking about you know, the, um, the impact of the great resignation that, you know, hit the industry. Um, I don't know if I already said this or not, but I I read an article where, um, I think it was an NAA's, um, on their website talking about the estimated churn was more like 70% last year. And as an industry, we're right around what 30, somewhere between 32 and 34, um, annually. And that's high, like for the United States, that's one of the highest churn rates for an industry which I didn't realize. I mean, I always talk about it, but I didn't realize what it was in, pers- in, in context of the country as a whole and other, in, other businesses. Um, but now as people are, you know, struggling, and, and I'll, hey, Resmond went through it too because we know there's inflation. It's impacting our employees. But there's also a fact of running the business and, you know, break even. And we also have bills. And so we're also dealing with that cost of inflation. And, when you're looking to attract talent, I think what's a challenge right now for a lot of people is, you know, all the rent growth is not cash flow. That's not, it doesn't fall straight down to the cash flow bottom line. There's a lot of expenses in between there. Um, and so companies are looking for what other value can I, can I bring to the table um, for employees and, and candidates to want to choose to work here? And so it made me think about what you were just saying. I don't know, the crazy idea, but in benefits packages and thinking about your health care providers. Maybe there's some free mental health classes or mental health um, hours that you could make available to your employees that might have some real value to people. Um, I don't know. Thoughts on that? Yeah, most um, most insurances do offer that for like mm-hmm. substance abuse and other things. But there is a resource, a- mm-hmm. and I think you have to opt into it when you're selecting your insurance mm-hmm. for your employees, right? Yeah. So we always did have that. Um, and I think the other challenge that we're having, not to go away from what we're just talking about, but 
while the issue was people found out that they could work on one paycheck or they found something else to do, now it's another, uh, one of those other squeezes come along. And so there's a depletion in the workforce. And so salaries have gone crazy. Mm -hmm. And what you, you know, for a maintenance person, what you used to be able to pay, now you're paying like almost $10 more an hour. Wow. And that that doesn't guarantee you're getting somebody that's 100% qualified. But I would say that going along with what we were talking about, training is very important and Mm -hmm. instilling into people like the the talents that they need. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you brought up a great point because I I, back in our management days, I think one of the things that I mean, I benefited from it um, and I would use this in our recruiting efforts. You know, you can and I'm not saying you shouldn't go to college because I wish I had finished. But if you don't have that path in life, coming into this industry is really unique because if you have the right initiative and drive, you can, you know, get promoted and you can move up the, the career path fairly quickly compared to other industries. I mean, it's not unreasonable to think someone could go from, you know, with the right performance and meeting metrics and, and KPIs and, and having the initiative can go from a frontline leasing to a property manager within four years. I mean, or you, shorter if, or shorter. If they have, yeah. if they have the common sense gene and something that you can work with, it makes yeah. it really seriously. I, yeah. I mean, and golden is a golden is somebody that worked with me forever. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was someone that came to me um, and she was a leasing person and she was filling in for somebody just so I had like a body at the property. This mm-hmm. was 12 years ago. And she ultimately ended up, she literally went from leasing to manager like within a month. Oh, my gosh. Because she had, had that it. gene, right? And so it's like. She could get the job done. She did. Yep. And well, and she doesn't still have does. four years of student <laughs> loan debt to follow her either. So I think as an industry, maybe we've got to get back to reminding people, um, our, our current employees, too, about. You know, you want to grow your career, but there's something to be said for reinvesting in yourself and your education and growing your skill set. And so for companies out there that maybe are considering, like, what are we going to do to, to be competitive in this space? Um, it's not just about pay. I mean, I, and, and sometimes it's reminding people about the benefit packages that you have that maybe they've taken for granted or they're not utilizing. Or like you said, what are you doing to train your employees? And, you know, are you showing them that, you're willing to invest in them and that you care about their success so that you can promote them and, and provide a future for them. Because right now is a moment in time and, you know, whether it'll level off or what that'll look like a year from now, from now, who knows, but at the end of the day, you still got to grow as a person if you're going to move up in an organization. And so if you're in a place where you're getting that, you're getting, um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but you're getting fed that way. That's a good place to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know y'all are really good at that. <laughs> Well, and I have a heart and passion for trades too. So, well, well, as an industry, we've got a lot of work to do there because we, I mean, I I think for 10, 15 years, it seems like we've been talking about maintenance and for probably longer than that. But I'm just saying for me, I can remember, I'm thinking back 15 years ago about why we have such a shortage of maintenance personnel in our industry. So I don't think we've still figured that out yet. All right, so I have another question for you that I wanted to ask, and this one's a bit self-serving. I'm going to admit it in advance um, because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a supplier. And it's from our side of the fence, you know, it's a, it was a very challenging market during the pandemic, um, especially because none of, for a while there, none of y'all were in your offices or answering the phones. Um, and, you know, the sales process and, you know, it's a, it's I think it's a challenge in general because again I used to be on your side of the fence and I think I remember joking at one point I came back from a, an AA event where one of my first ones where I, I gave my business card with my cell phone to everyone <laughs> and my email um, and I couldn't get through to anyone I needed to talk to I swear for three weeks because I was so bombarded but there were some good products and services in there that I could have benefited from and so uh, I can imagine in your role. Um, and especially just the voice and presence you have in the industry that you are probably bombarded on a regular basis for products and services. Um, so what advice would you give to my side of the fence about how do, how do we get in front of, of someone? I mean, assuming you really believe in what you're doing, because I know that you can have people move around a lot in this industry and every product, every company they go to, well, this is the next best thing. But like, I think we're fortunate. We have some longstanding 
um, regional VPs of sales in our organization have been with us for years. They really believe in what we're doing. So what would you advise, what advice could you give for somebody trying to sell to somebody like you? No, you're right. I mean, you know, at least, you know, in my inbox, half of my emails came from people who wanted to connect or, you know, the the ones that like catch you like it's like they're friends with you already. And then, you know, like, hey, Dawn, you know, just wanted to see if next week we can. And then you find out like, I don't even need this service. So mm -hmm. I think it's being realistic on the vendor side that mm -hmm. there's just times it's not something personal. And as somebody that represents the Apartment Association, I go out of my way to make sure that I give the time and attention to our suppliers because mm -hmm. they are the backbone of what we do in the industry, right? And we're a whole industry. It's not just property management. It's everything that it takes to make that happen. And if we didn't have yep. great suppliers, we wouldn't have what we get to do. Yes. So for me, it was always I triaged my need. Mm -hmm. Like, So if I needed like five products that were on my radar – I was going to reach from my database on the people that I had talked to, like at trade shows or mm -hmm. business exchanges, things that, you know, I wanted. That's one of the reasons I love the business exchange was because I was able to get in front of people on my time rather than trying to fit people in. Because as an executive, I can tell you, I didn't have time. Everything yeah. I did, I mean, I was busy from the time I hit I get hit the ground, you know, my feet on the ground in the morning. Until, sometimes before. <laughs> until I laid my head down at night. And then sometimes while I was sleeping, you know, I think I transacted <laughs> in my head. But um, and it's not. So I would say, number one, don't take it personally. If mm -hmm. somebody can't give somebody an audience, it's just a reality and it's it's not personal. But, um, you know, I would just make sure that it's a resource that they need mm -hmm. and that they're looking for. And I, I don't have that solution right off the top of my head, but I'm going to start thinking about that, how I can like maybe help bridge that gap. Yeah. And because if I need something, I'm going to call my peers. There you go. That's the bingo right there. Correct. And I'm going to say, hey, who do you use for security? Mm -hmm. Hey, who do you use for software? Yep. Hey, and they all better say Resmin is all I have to say. But. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's definitely growing out there. Just, um, but there yeah, is something I'm to playing. be said for that, though, about the reputation, because that's mm -hmm. that's um, and I'm sure you know this from our, our you know very first meeting. But part of the reason we've had the open and connected API at Resmin it's right off the bat, which mm -hmm. was a, a pretty big undertaking for our size and scale when we decided to stay committed to that, because there's a lot of expense that comes into having the open network that we do. I think we're upwards of almost, I don't know, like 175 integrated partners now um, that all need servicing. They all need interactions. And we, we ended up going from a person to an entire department. But part of why that was so important to us to stay that course was because of those relationships we had with the right suppliers, um, you, you know, early on in our management days. And when you have a true partner in the business, that that matters. But it's the reputation too. It's like how do they, how do they stand up? Like nobody's perfect out there, and every business has they're they're going to have their stumble, right? You're going to stumble and fall, but it's how you pick yourself back up. And I would imagine you guys have the same thing in in your business. You know, if you have a a misstep on a number or a budget miss. It's how you respond to that. Right. That's going to matter at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. And I can tell you that one of the greatest um privileges we had was to have a, a was to have Resmin as a partner. And I know that this is not a Resmin hour and you know yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to push the um the product. I'm really just trying to talk sincerely because when you work with a partner, the first question we would have to anybody if they were coming with their product is, do you integrate? Mm. Can mm -hmm. you integrate with Resmin? And if you didn't integrate with Resmin, chances are we probably weren't going to entertain that because we wanted everything so to work in sync. So it's your fault we have all those people in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't single-handedly take responsibility for it, but we, we had a few people that were pushing that on our end is all I'm saying. Uh, no, we wanted it because that gives you consistency and that gives the end user the best Mm -hmm. the best, you know, product that they can work with and also on the client side so that they can see because we were very transparent and we gave our clients real time information. Mm -hmm. And so they could see, you know, that knock was coming in. I don't mean to mention specific. Um, don't do. You're fine because they're okay. a great partner of ours, too. And, you know, knock 
they were able to see the Knox score. So we weren't hiding anything, right? We weren't like, oh, no. gosh, you know, let's like cover that up before, you know, we were always like, let's be proactive. We need to get their knock engagements up and we need mm. to make sure that the product's working. Yeah. Because if we're going to charge somebody for it, we need to make sure that it's a viable product. So yeah. we found great uh, consistency with all of our partners. Well, I'm going to give you a shout out and a big thank you because, you know, we, uh, much like you, just went through an acquisition. Um, so did Resmin. And, um, you know, that, I think that was one of the things that was important as part of the founding vision for me was we can't forget what got us here and, and understanding the suppliers in this space and how important they are to the operators and, and being able to choose who you want to work with is truly important at the end of the day. Um, so we were really fortunate that it was one of the, it was made very clear in our process and our, in the transaction that they believed in that themselves. So we were fortunate. So we're not changing that. <laughs> well, and everybody has personal choices, right? It, but mm -hmm. as you grow, like the bigger the the bigger the company gets, the more platforms you have to embrace because mm -hmm. you've got clients that want certain platforms. Yeah. So um, my job was always to just pitch the what I felt like I could, what I believed in, yep. and what I could see, and what I felt was you know the best possible mm -hmm. fit for them. Yes, and I know that because I've dealt with yeah. many of the people you 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 asked us to integrate with. <laughs> If you think over the last year and 12 months, you know, what was the recruiting efforts like? I mean, it's it, because it is such a competitive landscape and I don't know how many open positions you guys had. So I was just curious about what did anything change over the last year and a half for you guys as far as um, how you recruited and, and were thinking about retaining your employees? So recruiting, using recruiters definitely changed. That was something that oh, we really? morphed, in, morphed into where before it was always word of mouth, but there's only so much word of mouth. When hmm. the workforce was depleted, it was depleted. And, you know, but we would always go to our mainstay of, you know, who who do you know? You mm -hmm. know, do you know anybody? And then we were, I think. I think for us, we thought outside of the box. Okay. So when we hired our marketing person, we hired her right out of college as an intern and had her, she, but she ended up developing our website. She ended up, she was fresh. She had, you know, great um, energy and great ideas. And so uh, we weren't resistant to, we weren't resistant to change. We wanted that. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to be dinosaurs and, you know, like think, or, you know, get stuck in our ways. Correct. Yeah. So we wanted that. We wanted to embrace that. So and that's what we did. So yeah. we we want to hear from people that have those ideas. So we went outside. So you always heard about leasing, you know, yeah, you go to the Sonic and, you know, the person that has a great personality, you ask them if they want to be a leasing person. Mm -hmm. Well, we started doing that with other jobs, like within the industry, like within the corporate office and hmm. and thinking outside of the box rather than just going to, you know, we have to have somebody that knows property management. Yeah. Uh, Trying to know, go take accounting. somebody from a competitor. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So we and I, I for the most part, I believe it worked. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that because the um the, another conference that I was at this, uh, it was actually a women's group that we were we were talking as a group and they were talking about the competitive landscape and, you know, um, really struggling to find, you know, the candidates with the right amount of property management experience. It put me back in my management hat and I'm like, it seems like everybody I had that outperformed was hired from outside the industry, I'm not knocking us. I'm just saying from our front lines in leasing, you know, we did that. Like, you know, I remember somebody, believe it or not, at Dillard's. And if, and if that young man's listening, he'll remember this because he carried my bags out from a Dillard's to the car. And I'm like, what store is this? This has never happened before in my life. Um, but it was something they were doing, and he was really proud to do it. And in that process, he ended up coming to work with us at Courtney Manor and became our rock star leasing agent um, and then moved up through the organization. So, you know, as we're struggling to find talent in here, it just makes me wonder where should we be looking because this is still a great industry. I think we have some fatigued frontline team members. Um and money doesn't always solve for that problem. Right. Right. But let's talk about um, the uh, big elephant in the room for a lot of people, which was the work from home. Mm. That became, you know, how do you get a leasing agent to work from home? How do you get, you know, how can you, like, take the burden off of the staff? And, and we learned that through COVID, that mm -hmm. there are effective things that you can do that can help them gain. Because most people... Some people want money. Some people want time. And so mm -hmm. if you can find a way to generate time for someone and give them time back into their life so that they can go to their son's 
you know, or daughter's, uh, you know, softball game or soccer game. And, yeah. and it's not just limited to the weekends or you give them flex hours. So that's some of the things that we did. We, we did flex hours. Oh, wow. Um, we I would didn't let, realize that. We would let people come in at 10 and then, you know, work later or they had, you know, they could work from home on certain things. But we would let them have that time. Yeah. back in their life because you're never going to you're never going to lay your head down at the end of the day and say I wish I would have worked one more hour. <laughs> Amen to that. So. Yes. Well, I think that's a great. That's a great nugget that you just gave the audience there because this is a an ongoing conversation I'm hearing at every event I've been to for the last month and a half. Um actually going back all the way to January at NMHC's event. Um and they're struggling on how do we get competitive and just hearing you say that makes me think is that part of why we're having this some exodus, if you will, out of property management on the front lines and maybe even the back office is because of the companies that are willing to bring people in that will have some work flex work hours. Is that, what, that, is that mm -hmm. how you characterize it? Um, that they found a way to come in. And every time that conversation comes up, it's like, yeah, but you can't do that for the front lines. And it sounds like you figured out that you can. Well, it's and it's really not just me. It's other peers that I have in the industry, like Ian Mattingly, mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, some yeah. other forerunners that have really like thought about this and they do have ways that they do it. Now, we hadn't started to adopt that yet. But reality is, is that you can't be so rigid in your thinking that it has to be this way. And so this is how I look at it. If I give somebody if I tell you you have to do something. All of a sudden you're going to have this mm -hmm. wall. Right. But mm -hmm. if I say you know, hey, you can, you have the flexibility to do this. What we found is that people were finding their way back to the office anyway because they wanted to be there to be, you know, to talk to their comrades at arms and to have the resources and, and mm -hmm. different things. So it's, it's really a win-win at the end of the day. Yeah. There are some people that, um, like myself, that need people. <laughs> Like, um, and I'm, I'm from a software company, so I can tell you not all of our employees feel that way. <laughs> it's funny. There's a, a humorous story about when we moved into Resmond's office. Um, and I was so proud of, of the office space that we built out. And I think you've been there and visited it. Um, but we had all these electrical issues leading up. So we only had 90 days to take a completely gutted space and convert 23,000 square feet. And uh, it was a mad push. Thank goodness I'm from multifamily because we know how to get stuff done. And, uh, but we had this issue with the lights. And the first day goes off with it. You know, we have a big party and big tours and, and, and everybody's desks are set up for them. And it was so happy and positive. And I come in the next day. I kid you not. I've opened the door. I'm kind of ashamed of my behavior at this moment. But I open the door and I'm on the, on the wing with the product and dev team. And I'm like, why are the lights out? I'm so pissed. I don't even check anything. Because we had just worked on this for like a week and a half. And here's my lights are out again. So I'm on the phone call. And I'm making the phone call. And my voice is raised. And I'm really upset. I admit it. I'm ashamed of myself even telling the story. I can't even do it without looking. I can't even look at you. So I'm so ashamed. <laughs> and then one of our <laughs> developers on that side of the office, I guess, overheard my conversation. It's like, I'm like, okay, yes. And he's like, we unscrewed all the light bulbs. Because <laughs> they like to be reclusive <laughs> and I'm like I'll call you back <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if our team's listening everybody knows the story of Resmond because it's a true story it's exactly what happened <laughs> but like I said not everybody wants to be in that you know environment um but for those who do you know and having that flexibility so I, I'm I'm glad to hear that you guys were um embarking on that and I I think that's something as an industry we need to do and in Giving that time back, even if it's one day a week where I'm not sitting an hour and a half in traffic. Um, and I don't know if you knew this, but when I started, I was a single mom. Um, and I lived out on Lake Ray Hubbard. My daycare was over off, off Gus Thomason. Um, I don't know if you know where that's at, but that's 30, 635 area. And I worked at Monford Place, which was at Addison and Beltline. And this is back when they were doing the construction on I-30 and 635. It took me almost three hours between getting the kids somewhat ready to get in the car to the babysitter to work one way. And so, you know, I looked back at that time and thought about, because we, at the time they weren't allowing anybody else to live out on site and I couldn't afford to live in the area. That's was a single parent. And, um, it was a, as a trying time, but that was a lot of quality time that made, you know, life challenging because it felt like all I was doing was taxing and I didn't get to spend the time with my kids. By the time I got them home, it was practically bedtime you know, because they were little. So, um, yeah, I think that's awesome. And I, I hope more, more people in the industry 
you know, open their eyes to being more flexible. And I think the climate in the, in just society right now is people are frustrated, they're tense. And so it's a challenging place to be out there right now. So. Well, the key is, is you got to get the keepers, right. And the people that they're going to, if, if they've got eight hours of work and they only want to work for, they're going to find a way to do it and do it right. And with quality in mm-hmm. the time frame that they're given. Yep. And they'll get it done so that they can get that back from their life. Yep. I can speak to that because I've, you know, I work like I've had a Red Bull and I haven't. <laughs> you should see me when I do. <laughs> um, I so, have. <laughs> there's a lot of that. Yes, I, I have a speed that is in, not human. <laughs> As you've seen me in my in my mode, too. So no yeah. stones. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what I was thinking, too, about... Um, as you've just led your company and led your teams, and obviously you're a people first leader, and you know I, I've heard you, I see it, I've heard it from the um, beneficiaries of your leadership. And I was thinking about how would you characterize a difference between somebody a, a manager and a leader? Because it's weird to me. We have the terms, and the terms can sometimes set, you know, have a connotation with them in our space. I wondered, like, how, how would you characterize the difference? I think there's different types of leaders. Mm-hmm. I've always been or tried to be a servant leader that mm-hmm. leads from, right, is it the top down or the bottom up? <laughs> I forget what that is. But anyway, I try to, like, when I would go on site, I'm not there and, like, the queen's arrived. I'm there and I'm, like, you know, I'll, I'll clean the bathroom. I'll wash the, you know, the windows. I'll pick up trash. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, um, it, and it wasn't something that I had to work at doing. It was something that was organic in my heart to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had that modeled for me with the mentors that I had. So I believe that every leader needs to know who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, they need to not be stuck on themselves or, you know, want the position more than they want the product that they, they, they can produce in somebody else. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I am glad to say that I believe I did accomplish that in my career to um, make the place a better place because I went into it, um, not mm-hmm. because I was so great, but because I gave people the time. I really wanted everybody that worked with us to know that they were valued and that we cared about them. And I didn't I couldn't remember everybody's name. I can hardly remember all my grandkids' names. However, (laughs) I would make sure that, you know, I said hello to everybody because how many of us worked in this industry that we're on site? Because I was a manager on site. How many times would the regional walk in, walk right past all the other staff and go right into the manager's office, sit down, open up their laptop and start working, right? Mm -hmm. So I made it a mission and tended to surround our cells with regionals that felt the same way that when they get to a property their laptop's not going to be open it's going to be focused on the people and the things that that site needs Mm -hmm. and so I think that that's really important to have vision Mm -hmm. and or have implementation skills Hmm. very rarely you find somebody that has both when you do it's somebody who's divergent and they can you know get it all done um and I'd like to think that I can be a visionary and implementation at the same time. but So what do you mean by when you talk about being a good implementer? What does that mean? So I can have a vision, but I may not know how to get there. I have to yoke myself to somebody that can help me implement it mm-hmm. and put it into practice. Put it into practice in motion. So a lot of entrepreneurs are visionaries, but they're not great implementers. And a lot mm-hmm. of them are implementers, but they're not great visionaries. So they have to have that yin and yang. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, not everybody is, there are there are people that have both of them at, together and then... Yeah, we call those unicorns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you find that unicorn? Yeah. <laughs> but you're right, though. I mean, and that goes back to what you said about, um, I think we joked about it earlier, about the self-awareness, about where, you know, understanding your skill sets, your strengths and your weaknesses and not being into insecure to let someone else in that's going to help make you a better team and compensate for some of those weaknesses and um, I think it's great that you point that out because I I, if we think back I know myself I think back in my career I can see that's where I've seen leaders and and managers struggle is and we've seen it in the industry I think we've had some some tough talks about it and, and talk tracks about and unfortunately sometimes with women specifically like we leaning in to help one another and not feeling like, oh, I worked so hard to get here. You need to work just as hard. 
Um, I didn't have anyone helping me, so I'm not going to help you. I mean, I've heard people legitimately share stories like that with me, which is hard to, to comprehend when it happens. But, you know, a true test of a great leader is when things still run when you're not there. Yes. But we get, you know, in the industry, I see this so much. People are, are like, they want that control. They're afraid to let go of the control. And, and it, it's a shame because it, it holds you back. Yeah, not me. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like if I'm like, if I can keep on moving forward, I get to do the things that I love to do. And then in my wake are people that, you know, like Pat and I have raised up to be leaders. So mm -hmm. when, you know, I left Asset three weeks ago, I did that with nothing but the the best of feeling that I knew that the people that were there mm -hmm. had it. They yeah. didn't really, they really didn't need me anymore. It, and, and that, you know, there were necessary endings to start new beginnings. And I didn't, I, everybody always wants to be relevant and significant. They want to be, you mm -hmm. know, I don't care who they are. They want to know that they've made a mark. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when that time's over, you've got to know when to, walk away, you know, and leave it on a high note. Mm -hmm. And so I lo have loved working for Asset Living uh, the last six months. They're an amazing company and there's some great people. And I, I don't know everybody there, but there's, you know, a few Tyler and JC, if you're listening, um, they mm -hmm. are amazing leaders in this industry and they've got it and they're going to take it to the next place. And so I've got to yeah. figure out what my next, what my next is. Yeah. I love that saying that you just said. Sometimes there are necessary endings to start new beginnings to start new beginnings and, and that is well said yeah and yeah. you gotta know when to walk away and and not you know i mean i left on the best note i just knew that i wasn't really needed anymore mm -hmm. and nobody made me feel that way at all it's just that i really felt like gosh these people that have been raised up you know are they're ready to take it yeah and so let them fly yeah right yeah. So I could have kicked back and just collected a paycheck and, you know, just done nothing <laughs> with my life. But I that's not me. So, well, and I'll say kudos to you and Pat, because they uh, I've had the good fortune of personally being able to lean back in and work with some of your team over the last several years as we continue to develop our products. And you have some great thought leadership there and um, truly just great experiences with your team. So um, we're as fond of them as hopefully they're as fond of us. And uh, that's been a great experience. Thank so you. we've had a lot of conversation about being in leadership and property management. Um, but I also I also know that you are an amazing champion for the industry. You've been involved over the years in a variety of committees and uh, positions. So that's the one area that I wish I had gotten involved in earlier in my career. I just and then to this day, I, I struggle to figure out like why it didn't happen. Um, you know, I, believe it or not, I found out about NAA before I found out about AAGD. Like, I, and it may have been the company I worked for at the time. So I got exposed initially to that big picture. Um, but there's so much more I could have done before that. And so I'm just curious, how did, like, how did that start for you? And what advice do you give to, you know, property managers, regional managers that think that's only an executive level activity? Sure. So I, I was working at Pinnacle. Now I had been involved, like I had taught some classes and different things, but I was working at Pinnacle and uh, Candy Maxi was my, uh, my mm -hmm. mate, like, you know, over on the next cubicle. And she's the one that said, you know what? She said, I know what you would be fantastic at. She said, advocacy, and mm -hmm. I want to get you involved. And so she voluntold me, so to speak, right. Mm -hmm. And brought me into it. And then once I it's like property management. Once you get bit by that bug and you realize it's not about getting a position, it's not about like, hey, I've arrived and I'm on, you know, I'm on the board. It's not that at all. It's really just knowing that you can make a difference with mm -hmm. your sphere of influence. And I was enriched because of my experience with the Apartment Association where else can you go and learn what's happening legislatively? Can you imagine the time and the hours it would take just trying to decipher like the things that are coming at you at 24 seven, 365. So, I mean, the real heroes there are like the Jason Simons and the Ken Oldhams and mm -hmm. all the other people that are within the apartment association that get all of that information on the local level. Yeah. And then you bring it to the state level and then you bring it to the federal level and mm -hmm. you have a great um, organization that is really there for its members. 
And so yeah. I've always looked at it that I'm there to serve the members, mm -hmm. not to serve myself, so to speak, but it's a byproduct that I get all of this information that I was then able to take to my clients and yep. to their properties and then to network with council people and really make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, in our side, um, and it's funny, I don't, I don't hear the term as often on the property management side, or at least I didn't. Maybe, maybe it's thrown around now more than it used to be, but the, there's a term called the domain expertise. And so when we're looking to build products, we look for domain experts and we're looking mm -hmm. to utilize that domain expertise. And I think when I hear you say that, that's what I'm thinking of is that if you're in property management and you would hopefully, with the right initiative, right, you want to be a domain expert and the day-to-day -day operations is only one part of it, right? And great point about what happens, you know, starting at that local level. Advocacy really needs to start at the local level because that's where it starts to take hold first. And that has a direct impact on your, your community. How does somebody that's just you know, wants to get started, has never, you know, really been in, in, involved, but their their property's a member because they're part of, you know, the apartment association and um, potentially use the click and lease program. Um, but for somebody that's out there as a property manager that doesn't, has never engaged before, what, what would you advise for them? There's so many committees that they can sit on. Um, you know, you don't start on the executive committee, obviously, right? You start where you just start to go in mm -hmm. and then, you lend a hand when there's things that are needed. You know, there's mm -hmm. so many committees, you know, from the toy, uh, you know, from the toy run to um, oh. we serve the community. Right. We serve legislative and then we serve our body. And so uh -huh. there's a lot of things that people can get connected with. Yeah. So I would say. And it um, doesn't cost anything to be involved in the committees because you're already paying for your membership correct. dues. Correct. And we're always looking for people that have fresh new um, ideas mm -hmm. to bring to the table and to help. Yes. But is it the ECHO committee still or what's the next gen? Yes, the next gen. But the next gen isn't just like the next gen anymore. They've they've brought in their horizons, you know. So if you're if you're past like, you know, if you're on the cusp of 38 and older, you can still join. No, they really want to bring people into the industry that mm -hmm. have that. So I encourage anybody to get involved. You can call the local association. You yeah. can check with, um, you know, somebody if your company's highly involved. But if your company's not, mm -hmm. then get involved. The other thing is IROs. IROs are so important in our industry that the independent rental owner, mm -hmm. and they bring a lot to the play. So your lifestyles groups, your Brad Sumerak groups, those types of groups, their energy is needed as well. And so we have a real healthy IRO group. Yes. Nationally, yes. Uh, statewide, and also locally. Yes. Yes, we do. I was going to say, I have several of the lifestyle customers that have uh, started with Resmond back, oh my gosh, in 2013. And uh, one in particular, I, uh, that's how, how uh, Kim Bays came through our, our universe initially. And I think she's like 8,000 units or something now. It's like, yeah, and there's a lot of potential. It's a lot of, it's a good group. And it's really neat to watch how they support one another also. So it's funny what you were saying about the next gen. I'm really glad to hear that. I don't know if you know the story, but there's a young man that used to work with us at Sequoia that was one of the committee members to to try and, and help launch what was initially called Echo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember. Yeah. The, and Andrew <laughs> and uh, who I've mentioned a couple of times on the, the podcast. Someday people are going to need to show pictures of people like, who is this? Who is this infamous Andrew Mills? <laughs> but he was awesome. And he had so much energy and, and he was so passionate about it. But he would come back to our corporate office and talk about it. And so guess who got to help collaborate? And I was getting all excited about the first meeting and then found out I couldn't go. <laughs> and I was like, but I picked the theme song. <laughs> I was like, man, that's a rude reminder that I'm the old one here in the group. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that because, yeah, you know, don't count us out yet. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's not the pasture. <laughs> um, people need mentors. I mean, mm -hmm. our, young, our young people need mentors. And mm -hmm. mentors need to stay up with the latest and the greatest, right? And yeah. so it's a great marriage. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I think we talked earlier about what makes this industry so special. And um, I think that has to be part of it, too. I know I wouldn't be where I'm at today without so many people being so giving of their time and being willing to mentor. Um, and advice wise, I think, you know, I know you're willing to because you, you've mentored me. <laughs> you know, when I've needed help, you were there. And um, I know you've done it for many, many people in the industry. And so, um, you know, I I encourage people to continue to reach out and, and get to know Dawn whenever they get the opportunity to do that. So 
My other question I was going to have is, if you had to have your one moment of serving the industry, what would you say is the proudest or most rewarding moment? So one of the boards we didn't mention that I'm on is the Lake Highlands uh, Public Improvement District. Okay. And that is something that was just, I was so passionate about Lake Highlands. And back in the um, like early 90s, okay. when Lake Highlands was a when different place. you were in place. high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and anybody will be my new best friend who believes that. <laughs> there you go, guys. I just gave you the secret golden ticket. That's right. Um, it was just an area I saw because I have a, I have a very keen mind for real estate. Mm -hmm. And I love to spot trends. And Lake Highlands was one of those places I was like, Man, the Cowboys used to be, you know, in this area. You're right off of 635. You're not far from the tollway. It's just so strategically placed mm -hmm. that I knew that it was on the cusp of, like, changing. And then, um, you know, then the downturn in the market happened um, mm -hmm. in, you know, mid-90s. And then uh, in 2000, I forget exactly when we came out of it, but it kind of stalled. You yeah. saw some something happen on 75 and... You know, Richardson started bleeding over into that yep. Lake Highlands area. And then it started to like really just infiltrate that area and really start to change it. When I got invited, because we had a lot of properties in Lake Highlands, so I got invited to the advisory committee and then to Lake to the to the board itself. And I feel like I've really made um I've hmm. really made a difference there because I can bring the apartment perspective where I sit on the board with people that own real estate there that mm -hmm. own homes and before were anti uh, yeah. apartment community are now just starting to see like hey those apartment people aren't bad people they really they really do care they're not just you know slum lords i hate that word slum lord yeah. but um they just it it started to really change and so that's when i really started to get involved with more of the ledge and mm -hmm. understand like that our politicians are not rock stars they're good people. They're public servants, and they they all enter office with a heart to make a difference. But then some, we're along the way. They they're not the experts in our field, and that we have to be the ones that can yep. have that conversation with them. Yep. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because you don't know this, um, but I live up in you know the Prosper Salina area, um, and there aren't really any apartments. I think there's one development that's finally gotten started up there, but. As I, I was driving around and I was actually seeing some of the um, employment issues, the labor issues, because it's exploding. But the the jobs that are fifteen, twenty dollars an hour, that's such a drive because you can't afford to live in that area because there's no affordable housing, but there's no apartments, period. Like I was really surprised by this. Um, and so we've talked for years in legislative meetings about, you know, biting back about this not in my backyard. And I love that now there's this initiative about yes in my backyard. So I think we just found the the poster, um, the face for the poster right here. And I think we should lean on Tonway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's an important conversation. And, and so much so that I'm looking into being on the um, council planning and zoning or <laughs> yes. what I don't even know where to start with committees. But I was told planning and zoning is probably a good one so that we can help shape that perception and give them a more accurate perception about how um, apartment owners and residents themselves can be good stewards of the community. So, And I think you'd be amazing. And I, I really encourage people to get involved on the local level, like in their town or in mm -hmm. their city, because that's, that's where you can really have the most impact Yeah, to make things happen. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing this. I'm, I, I told you the time goes by fast here. Um, and I didn't want to end without giving you a chance to, to talk a little bit about last the last part, which is the best part maybe even, about the things that are truly near and dear to your heart, which is the, the charity work that you do and the groups that you interact with. And I know I don't want to steal your thunder, but you were just telling me about a, a great event that you were just participating in. But I wanted to give you a minute just to, you know, talk to us a little bit about you know, the, those charities that are near and dear to your heart and how you get engaged with them? Sure. Um, well, the first one I'd like to mention is uh, Restored Hope Ministries in Refuge City. Uh, both of those are geared around people coming out of sex trafficking and human trafficking. They're different in the way that they approach um, the issue. Like uh, Refuge City is for um, girls and I, I think probably also boys that are like 18 and under hmm. that are at risk 
youths and that get into a lifestyle or can be taken out of that lifestyle. And then there's uh, Restored Hope Ministries, which helps. uh, They're part of a court program where instead of somebody going in and just automatically getting a felony or, you know, their life being Mm -hmm. ruined, they can go into a two year program. And there's such transformation that happens. And these people are like, they're just warriors for, um, Oh, wow. For trafficking. And I think it's amazing. So um, to that degree that I can help, I always like. The other one is my one of my most very favorite, which is um, Furnishing Families of Texas. Annabelle Walno is an amazing uh, woman. Her husband is uh, a teacher. He's in the marketplace ministry. But she has furniture. Like if somebody's home burns down or somebody's apartment burns down she will provide furniture for people but she go- mm. it just transcends like anything i've ever seen and i've never seen someone that has such a heart that networks with other nonprofits so oh, wow. I, and that i'm just like touching the tip of the iceberg for what you know these yeah. folks do we so. wanted to give you a chance to talk about them and and hopefully some of them will be listening, and uh, we can inc- we can incite some passion and maybe even some donations that direction because I know those organizations need they need the help. Um, so kudos to you. I don't know how you do everything that you do, and uh, I love that you're in red today because it's kind of like a, a a Wonder Woman and your cape. <laughs> Well, now that you mentioned that, there was the Denton County Supervisor Retreat that we had on Tuesday. We had a superhero oh. theme. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Which, we had the Avengers <laughs> as the table uh, tops, and it was it was really neat to give back to the CPS workers that work so hard. Wow. Oh, yeah. And have to see sometimes the worst of the worst. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that is again. That's another whole nother level of frontline essential worker right there. And, and imagine it as much as it's taxing in our industry, I can't even imagine being in theirs. And we got them capes and masks. Did you? Yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> did you get some good pictures? Yes. Sure did. <laughs> you know, I, I encourage everyone to you know, lean in. And if you don't know Dawn Way, I definitely reach out and, uh, and get to know her and connect with her because I have no doubt there are many great things on your horizon. So, um, I just want to say thank you again. I hope you enjoyed your your podcast. I did. It yeah. did fly by. I hope you got more than one or two things that you can glean uh, <laughs> that doesn't edit it to a 10 minute, you know. <laughs> oh, podcast. no. I already, I've done this enough. I know we have some good stuff and you have some great advice. And that's, you know, that, again, that's what this is about. Um, we don't always have to learn everything the hard way in life. It, it's sometimes learning for people who've been there, done that and um, putting that to good use is also personally, I think that makes you the smartest one in the room. <laughs> Well, I pushed myself past my my um, comfort zone, right? And so if you don't do that, if you stop uh, learning, you stop growing. So I, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Yes. Well, you did great. And uh, I look forward to seeing what the next chapter is. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm invited, but I'm definitely inserting myself. You're always invited. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like, here's Elizabeth again. <laughs> it's like she's just right here. No, I'm excited I, for you. I, I am I'm so glad to see how whole you are, and I I hope you feel as celebrated as you deserve because I know you didn't do it alone, and and there's a lot of great people at CityGate Group, but um, you are definitely instrumental, and it's a great company. It's embedded in another company right now with with Asset Living, but uh, I'm sure they'll continue to do great things. But I was there to see the journey when you guys were starting, Mm -hmm. and so I know what it was like, and uh, you did just an amazing job, and... uh, I'm proud that we were partners along for that ride, too, for the record. Well, thank you. Well, um, you're we welcome. wouldn't have been the same well, without make Elizabeth us... Francisco. <laughs> well, I don't get credit. It's like I can tell you, my God bless our, our Resmond team members, they, uh, because sometimes I, I'm like, wait, who do you work for? Well, I mean, I guess we always work for the customer, but you keep talking like you're in City Gates office. <laughs> I'm like, have they offered you a job? <laughs> they don't need a Resmond trainer. They just keep using Resmond. <laughs> So um, anyway, so guys, um, as as we're wrapping up today, again, thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed today, and uh, I look forward to doing this again. I hope that you also enjoyed this episode and that you guys will join us again next time. Be sure to subscribe to Prop Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more about Resmond's property management platform and to get more insight on the multifamily ecosystem, visit myresmond.com. Bye guys.